それでは皆様次のセッションを始めましょう。Let's begin the next session. テーマは Web3 と AI が交差するところ。The theme will be The intersection of Web3 and AI.Speakers are Sahara AI CEO co-founder Sean Ren, Block Value Inc. CEO Motofumi Onishi, Origin Trail founder Tomas Levac, Microsoft Banking Transformation Leader Amit Ranjan. よろしくお願いします。Come on up! So, this is the only Japanese we are going to speak here, <laughs> but after this, we'll be speaking only in English. So, a very quick introduction. My name is Amit.、Uh, I work for Microsoft. I lead the banking transformation team for Japan and Korea, and I'd like to invite the panelists to give a very quick introduction about themselves. So, Thomas. Hi, everyone.、Uh, this is Thomas. I'm the founder at Origin Trail.、Uh, yeah, our world revolves around the A combination or the convergence of artificial intelligence,、um, blockchain, and the internet as a whole.、Uh, so, I guess everywhere where you can find the importance of trust and transparency、uh, when it comes to data, this is where、uh, our interest, focus, and vision lies.、Um, yeah, I look forward to this conversation.、Uh, hello, everyone.、Uh, my name is Motofumi Onishi.、Uh, I'm a pure Japanese, and we're the pure Japanese company. Uh, we are the manufacturer of a GPU server, as well as we have a data center in the northern part of Japan and run our own、uh, manufacturer GPU server, as well as、uh, provide computing power to AI and Web3、uh, companies. Thank you. Hey everyone, I'm Sean Yen. I'm a CEO and co founder of Sahara AI and also associate professor of、uh, USC at、uh, Los Angeles. So, Sahara AI is、um, a purpose built blockchain platform that is really prioritizing sovereignty and prominence of AI access.、Uh, the simpler way to understand it is we're trying to build a copyright system that can really bookkeep all of the important transactions in the process of developing the AI models. Well, thank you very much, everyone.、Um, so, as we all know, AI and Web3 are two very important groundbreaking technologies. And what we intend to do in this session is to talk about the opportunities, challenge, real world applications, then theory. And without much ado, I'd like to get straight into a couple of questions which I prepared for the session. So,、um, first of all, the question is what are the most promising use cases of the intersection of AI and Web3 that you believe will significantly impact traditional industries? So, who, do, who, who wants to take this? Okay, go ahead, Sean. I can start first, thanks.、Um, that's a great question. I've been thinking this for the past year and a half when we started、um, really flushing out a vision and roadmap for Sahara AI.、Um, personally, because I've been working in AI for over 15 years, as a, first as an academic person and then as sort of an entrepreneur,、um, I think the interesting thing about AI is a lot of things right now really working is depending on.、Um, Efficiency, right? Efficiency of compute, efficiency of putting together talents into a company, a small group of talents into a company to make things work, and efficiency of getting data for everyone here, getting feedbacks to improve the model. And this whole efficiency is asking for a lot of centralizations. 
And this is really against the principle of Web3 or crypto per se, which asks for decentralization. So really, what we learned for the past year or so is like, if you're forced to combine um, a sort of Web3 decentralization principle into the development of AI, oftentimes you'll find these controversial and conflicts happening and really slow down things. For example, um, applying a decentralized compute network might not be the best solution right now because centralized compute is still outperforming a lot of the decentralized version, but I'm not saying like the gap is not closable, right? Um, another example is like you, if you find out, you, if you ask a bunch of people over the globe in an independent way to come up with ideas to improve AI, it's oftentimes working less efficient compared to having this group of talents really grouped together uh, physically, talk to face face, and then do things. So, uh, but I do see one big opportunity and directions for um, how decentralizations will help AI is to change the, the relationship of um, um, who's owning what and, and who is contributing what, right? One great example is that like, if you think about when, how ChatGPT was created by o OpenAI, they scraped the entire Wikipedia, uh, New York Times, GitHub, uh, Reddit, and they, they generate these models, learning from the data, but they're not giving back any benefits of what ChatGPT have made or, in terms of revenue back to all of these upstream contributors. And this is really like a broken relationship for the economic perspective. And we think that decentralization is a better way to really, uh, for example, using the Sahara blockchain, you can bookkeep who have done what in the whole process of the AI creation, right? For example, you and me, we create a data set together and the data set was used to update a model and the model was wrapped into application and start monetizing itself down the road. And that whole process, if it's recorded on blockchain, then you can use that what we call provenance structure to do the revenue sharing model, which like every single dollar made by the API of that application can automatically through smart contract giving back to every upstream participants. That's like one example of how by changing the relationship in a immutable and sort of transparent manner with the blockchain technologies, you can power AI in a better way, in a more fair, uh, compensated way. Well, thanks for that, Sean. And uh, Tomas, I'm about to come to you because uh, at the backstage, we were talking about a couple of very interesting examples around sustainability and stuff. So do you want to briefly share your thoughts around that? Yeah, sure. I think it is a, get, a great, great segue. So Origin Trail, you know, we've been developing the decentralized knowledge graph, which is the core component to provide that trust and transparency when it comes to uh, to data and knowledge uh, since the first version launched in 2018. So, and what we've considered that is actually a kind of a different branch of AI uh, compared to what really is kind of blowing up right now. It's called symbolic AI, this knowledge graph uh, direction. Uh, and then two years ago, we have you know open AI coming out, dropping the chat GPT, kind of the, the whole um, the whole the whole explosion starting to happen around the use of um, uh, generative AI for the, the neural networks, and with, with our work, we've been uh, fortunate enough to work with some, some large organizations um, and, and doing implementations, uh, anything from the, the companies like Walmart, Home Depot, Costco, which utilize Origin Trail to exchange knowledge on the audit report data on over 25,000 factories uh, overseas, uh, Swiss Federal Railways and many others. Um, but the thing that kind of like there's a few revolving themes that we're catching when it comes to AI uh, that are problematic for companies willing to implement it. One is explainability. So how do I know what I'm receiving back from an AI powered system? What was it constructed from? Um, the second part that was a lot of time the, the question was reliability. Can I be sure that my system won't produce something that will get me in trouble? Um, you know, we've all heard the cases of like the uh, cars being offered for one dollars and policies being made up by for for the for the um, uh, air carriers and and all sorts of things. So that's a big consideration. And the third one is IP. Is how do I ensure that my solution is actually aligned with my moral, ethical, and also legal obligations? And this is where I feel the intersection with with Web3 uh, and the decentralized knowledge graph is really powerful because you can offset. Uh, each other's negatives uh, by leaning these technologies um, to each other. So for, instead of having hallucinations, we can have information provenance. 
instead of having the kind of unreliable AI, which you don't know, you can have a, an AI which you can um, kind of create a fence around the knowledge base that you feel, and you know who the owner, the issuer um, of, of that knowledge base is, and it can op you have an AI solution operating on exactly that. Um, and thirdly, with, with IP, uh, you know, it was also kind of mentioned before, the importance of being able to attribute and uh, compensate uh, in order to create scalable solution is, is very much uh, needed. So, yeah, this intersection, I feel, is, is one that it's absolutely necessary, not only as a nice-to-have for both technologies, um, but actually if we want to have AI that the entire humanity can be included in, in a proper way, and if we want to have Web3 that actually people and AI agents will be able to interact with, we need to converge those two things together and make them internet scale. And once we achieve that, we have the right uh, kind of blueprint to see this mainstream adoption happen in any industry that we can actually think of. So wherever internet is present today, this is where the intersection of AI um, and Web3 can influence positively uh, as well. Thanks for that, Tomas. I think that this is a good lead into my next question, which is, what are the biggest misconceptions about the integration of AI and Web3? Um, and how can these be addressed to foster broader adoption and innovation? So, I mean, anyone who feels appropriate can take this question. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, we're, we're on a, we're kind of on, on, on a moving um, function here. Right. Uh, so it, it, it really started, I remember it was maybe conversations we were having a year and a half ago or something like that, and someone was mentioning AI and, and Web3, it was mostly trading bots. Like, can I have a bot that will trade for me yeah. independently and I don't have to deal with it so gains happen ma like magically? So that was like the, the whole idea. And I think if we look at the, um, the, the, if we make a section of the industry right now, it's much more mature in terms of understanding some of these important uh, primitives that the Web3 can bring to AI um, and, and vice versa. Yeah, so I think that that would be the misconceptions would mostly stem from the fact that it just was, we were early, and now it feels that this uh, understanding and appreciation is much more there. And to be honest, also working with clients or having like people build on, uh, on these infrastructural components that are created show that they understand why someone would be using Web3. They understand that protecting data is important. Uh, they understand that verifiability is important, that identity is important when we're dealing with AI. And if you think of the future where you will have AI agents also be economic agents, when they will have to own things, I don't know, self-owned car, um, that car will have to access certain knowledge. That car will have to act on certain e in certain economic transactions. And the Web3 primitives, again, from identity, transactions, uh, the, the capability of um, ensuring ownership um, and new business models, they're like they were made for, for AI agents. So, yeah, I, I feel there's the, from misconceptions to, to, to a happy path is, uh, is a jump we can make. Sure, thanks. Mike, I think you got something. Yes, uh, so people think... Uh, AI, Web3, maybe different thing, um, or somebody commingled. From the GPU server provider standpoint, actually, it's very common, meaning it consumes huge uh, computing power. And whether it's like a machine learning or whether it's a high quality graphic rendering, probably in metaverse as well, uh, everything currently is uh, very vulnerable to the computing power. And many people, I think, take it for granted that this computing power is available to everyone. But for example, this uh, January 1st, we had an earthquake uh, in Japan. And people were cut, water and electricity was cut down. Now you suddenly uh, realize that infrastructure is so important. And without this uh, high uh, evolving GPU trend, neither Web3 or AI could exist or grow. So I think that part is uh, extremely important. And uh, we want it to be the infrastructure of Web3 and AI, either way or both. And everybody uh, would be happy to uh, develop 
their uh, application on this infrastructure. I think that's how it's going to uh, evolve. Thank you. Yeah. Just want to quickly add, um, I think right now a lot of confusions about the integration of Web3 and AI is because they don't differentiate AI for Web3 versus Web3 for AI, right? I want to just quickly touch on that. Um, there's a lot of AI for Web3 kind of a discussion, which is like applying this like new generation of generated AI technologies to blockchain data, right? Security, auditing, um, um, automatically doing trading and so on. This is this huge opportunity for doing that. I, I think I'm, I'm very uh, bullish on that part. But then for Web3, uh, on the crypto or Web3 for AI part, there's a lot of nuances. For example, many times we will see projects pitching your idea that, hey, I'm gonna um, apply crypto for AI in terms of like creating a new economic mechanisms and then incentivize everything with maybe the token and, and so on. But then you can ask the question, why do I have to use the, the crypto incentivization, right? I mean, these questions usually will, will sort of uh, create a lot of like uh, interesting follow-up questions. Like you don't necessarily see having a sort of uh, incentivizations will necessarily tackle the bottleneck for AI problem. For example, it's not gonna solve the economic imbalance issues of AI problem. It's not gonna make the compute faster. It's not gonna make your data higher quality when, so you can build a better model. So sometimes these questions hasn't been really fully addressed in many of these like uh, decentralized AI projects. So from my perspective, I think one fundamental problem for AI right now is, again, the, the sort of uh, the relationship between the contributors and the final uh, developers of the model who can monetize the model. I think this relationship hasn't been established in a very fair way. Therefore, most of the revenue go back go to the application builder, but not attribute back properly to the upstream contributor. And therefore, I see blockchain is a huge opportunity for you to really do a sort of a provenance infrastructure to do bookkeeping to really support a sort of copyright system for AI. Yeah. Thanks, John. Um, on, on that particular point, I actually have a follow-up question for you, uh, which is, what are the key challenges that are there in combining AI and Web3 technologies, and how can these be overcome to create more robust decentralized solutions? I know you were touching upon decentralization, but um, you know the intent is to have you double-click on that and talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to elaborate on uh, two concepts and their relationship. One is um, blockchain, one is um, user privacy. And these two things are kind of closely related to each other, but you, many projects, you probably do one of them, but not the other. I, I think the, the point I'm trying to make here is these two things are really closely related to each other. If you lose one of them, the other one may not necessarily make sense. For example, when you're trying to monetize your personal data, let's say your text messages, your emails, your personal pictures, right? One of the way you can monetize it is you use your personal data to build a sort of uh, uh, AI model just for yourself. And this AI model might be your personal replica. And if you have a established business process, say if you are a sales or BD person, or you are a trader, or, or you are a KOL that you talk to people, engage people, to monetize your personal knowledge, then you can use your personal data in a way that your AI gonna monetize things for you. Uh, under this uh, premise, the question is, if you lose access, you lose control to your personal data, if you upload this to OpenAI, upload this to AWS or the cloud, then you don't have the transparency about how your data gonna be used down the road by the centralized AI players. They might be aggregating all of the individual data and then update the next version of GPT, which might be outperforming you. I mean, this is already happening. GPT-5 gonna be a PhD level um, models versus GPT-4 right now is like a college level sort of a student type of a model, right? So really, if you don't have user privacy, if you don't protect your personal data, uh, then you wouldn't be really talking about monetizing your personal knowledge in the, down the road in the future. It's not gonna be a long-term thing. Uh, so. What I'm seeing here is you have to have user privacy to get to be guaranteed. Then you can use the blockchain to record it, your contribution in building a sort of AI at the downstream pipeline. And then you can consider revenue sharing as a new economic mechanisms for attributing all of the revenue back to the individual contributor. These two things work closely to, with each other. You cannot just do one without the other. Thanks for that. Uh, so Mike or Thomas, do you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, so I, I really uh, echo uh, Sean that uh, 
So one of our uh, group company or the partner company is, uh, I actually encourage you, you to uh, visit our uh, booth C17, which is uh, called VOI, V-O-I. And this is actually a very good combination of AI and Web3. Uh, so maybe you may know, but there are about $100 billion worth of uh, travel loyalty uh, program not redeemed each year because it's so fragmented. Some big airlines, hotels have a program. Uh, small ones don't. They don't uh, interact with each other. So this VOI platform is to uh, help all the uh, people who has their loyalty program as well as don't have loyalty program uh, under one uh, cryptocurrency. It's called VOI. And so, but uh, as Sean mentioned, the security is very extremely important. Uh, we will be facing lots of people's uh, uh, individual independent uh, information. And also that's, we probably going to leverage that as AI uh, to market, to use it as marketing. And so uh, people will be happy to play on our platform but we need to make sure it's 100%, 120% secured for everyone to uh, happy to use it. Thanks. Yeah, I'll maybe borrow two, two thoughts from two Turing Award winners, uh, one of which we're lucky enough to, to be our advisor as well. And I'll start with Dr. Bob Matkev, um, who was the inventor of Ethernet. And uh, he was explaining just in a conversation we had recently how a he's seen AI rise and then dramatically fall, rise and then dramatically for, fall ever since uh, the 60s and that the kind of the, a lot of the reasons or the major reason for that was always it ran out of data. So right now it seems that it's not, um, it's not running out of data. However, we have this uh, very, very burning challenge of fidelity um, of, of AI and here is where decentralization tying in another Turing Award winner, uh, winner uh, Jan LeCun, who said that if we want to have a humanity-represented AI, we need to ha make it be inclusive. And this is where decentralization from where kind of we're looking at is really powerful and can, can achieve those, those goals that at the one side, we will not be running out of relevant data. So not only just data, because it can also be uh, suboptimal data, especially right now where we'll have more AI generated content online than we have user, then these types of tactics of just kind of copying everything you find online will no longer really work to advance a particular model. And then varietal, uniquely uh, created data and knowledge will become much, much more valuable and at the same time also necessary uh, in order to not only in, like improve the model in terms of making the biggest model that's possible. Um, but also in terms of creating solutions where maybe even smaller models may perform better, which are towards the edge um, of, the, of the network. So your phone, your fridge, uh, your TV, your car, your, you know, anything that's, um, that's, that's kind of connected to the internet but can be improved by having an AI-powered uh, solution on top of it. However, it needs that infrastructure layers of being accessible with, uh, with, with infrastructural components to run the AI models, being accessible from infra components that allow you to connect your data and pair it with um, what, is, what is the public, uh, public domain uh, knowledge. And together, when you have these components, you can really create a, a much more decentralized, a much more representative, and a much more efficient solutions that, uh, that are indeed the true kind of Web3 X um, AI realization of that vision, which allows you that information provenance, it gives you that verifiability, respects the ownership, um, and at the end of the day, of course, also drives new new economic models. Um, so yeah, I think that that role of decentralization of of um, within this uh, AI age needs to get get expanded and more aggressively thought about uh, than maybe just what we were considering to be. Um, so far, but yeah, like I, I mean, from from the market perspective, we're seeing really a lot of uptake on that and appreciation and understanding. And just because there's a lot of benefits to do it, and at the end of the day, that's what makes or breaks any anything is when it comes. It's you know, regardless of really the the rails, it's going to be is this creating more value 
for a user or for a company or for an individual uh, than the alternative. And if we manage to do achieve that, which I think we're on a good track to, um, yeah, then, then we can be successful. Sure. Thank you very much. So I'm looking at the watch. We have five minutes and 33 seconds left. And I have two questions. Okay. Uh, actually, I have three. Um, so I, I'd like you to be very quick. So Thomas, uh, first one is for you. Uh, although we have spoken about a variety of things, but can you share with us um, an example, a real-life example, where integration of decentralized AI and blockchain has solved real-life problems? Yeah, you're welcome to join. We have a webinar that's taking place actually this week with Swiss Federal Railways, which is speaking about how you can create a decentralized repository of knowledge of like real-time um, railway data. Uh, across multiple countries, and then use that paired with AI tools or, or AI models, which again, there can be plenty in this choreography uh, of, of deploying a solution, um, but the value proposition is that they can go from having just very limited access of like tip of the iceberg to all of a sudden having huge access to knowledge which spreads across different um, organizations and countries but it's not in a way where anyone has to give up their entire sovereignty of data, no. Everyone keeps their sovereignty, everyone keeps their ownership. Everyone just asks each other on a need-to-know basis on the depending on what the particular, um, particular question is. And I think they'll be showcasing also live a uh, demo on the wear and tear of the wheels uh, on, the, uh, on, on, the, on the rail cars. Uh, in Europe and how you can identify which one should be maintained sooner by utilizing this. Um, if you want one public one, you can also go on europeangymnastics.com, which is the Gymnastics uh, Continental Federation. Again, uh, real deployment in production case utilizing blockchain-based decentralized knowledge graph uh, and artificial intelligence to allow better access to information about uh, gymnastics uh, to any, any fan, any uh, user, any, any visitor of their website that chooses to do so. So uh, maybe those two will be uh, good enough of a start, but of course, thank well, you very much. Dig deeper. Wonderful, thanks. So, Sean, I'm going to go to you. Um, you have one minute to answer this. Uh, actually, one minute and thirty seconds. So, in your view, what ethical considerations must be addressed when developing decentralized AI solutions, particularly regarding data privacy and security? I know you touched upon this, but can you double-click on this again, please? Yeah, totally. I mean, right now, uh, the, the game is really in balance for uh, two-sided market, right? So suppliers, for example, everyone here, you write things onto tweets, you write things into Wikipedia, you upload your code into GitHub, but you never got compensated because do, doing that, because other people, companies, small, medium business, or enterprise like Google, Meta, OpenAI, using your data to change their model, you never get contributed back. Um, so, so that's a problem. Uh, that's a very imbalanced relationship. And the way of using blockchain to do this is to really record your contribution in an immutable and transparent manner. Anyone can come back to verify, hey, I'm part of this data set, and this data set was used by Microsoft, for example. I mean, we really work with Microsoft on one of the multimodal data sets for their Microsoft Research Reasoning Project. And, um, and, and yeah, if this happens, then I can come back and I can say, hey, I'm part of this, and you should split revenue with me. And I think that's one big big way to really go for, for the uh, more healthy sort of uh, economic models within the AI uh, development, yeah. All right, thank you. So we have a couple of minutes left. Um, last question from my side, um, and it's a difficult one, okay? Uh, be ready. So if you had to describe your experience at the intersection of Web3 and AI in one word, what word would that be or it be and why? So, Sean, do you want to start? I would use the word nuanced because it's so much noise. Yeah. Thank you. Mike? Uh, so people call it like a disruption or transformation, uh, decentralization. But I would say it's, it's a revolutionary because uh, it's not, we're not just sticking to the uh, current business model. Everything is changing. It, it could be uh, disruptive. But we are, I think, creating developing a uh, very different business model that it didn't exist in the past. So I would say revolutionary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll go for a noun if that's okay. I'll just say I think for us it's trust. Um, and it's, uh, AI is bringing whole lots of challenges when it comes to trust and how we understand it, perceive it. Uh, 
maybe we're not even aware of all the challenges that are connected to trust just yet, uh, but I feel this is going to be the, the one of the most important pillars that we have to fight for um, when in the age of AI. It's, it's going to be how do we trust the source in this case. Thank you very much. So uh, with that, uh, we have 30 seconds left and uh, give our panelists a round of applause for a wonderful panel. And I understand, you know, this discussion doesn't end here. You know, this is just a beginning and we'd love to see all of you contributing and pushing the boundaries forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can stand at the center of the stage, we'd like to take a group photo. Thank you. Web3 to AI が交差するところ、ディナーセクション Web3 in AI。Thank you very much。ありがとうございました。さあそれでは次のセッションはまもなく始めますのでよろしくお願いいたします。The next session will begin very momentarily. Thank you.